Okay, so let's see. Um, so I think last time we uh, essentially the bullets we started with this excellent of uh, the development of the lattice. Yeah. And then we showed uh, that in the continuum limit. Again, uh, the coefficient up here changes. Yeah. 
and I think it would uh, change to 1 over root 5. <coughs> okay? So, this is just a, just a comment. So these formulas will always look a little bit different in various uh, papers in the literature because people normalize the Hamiltonians in a different way. Okay? So if you find something which has some odd uh, constant up there, it basically means people have normalized the Hamiltonian in a particular way. Now, another difference is, so I, I basically introduce these five factors so that my right moving fermions can anti-commute to the left moving fermions as they must. Okay? Um, and uh, I had to do that because in this uh, scheme I was working with, where I uh, considered my compact boson on a periodic ring, uh, I had introduced these right moving and left moving uh, bosons in such a way that they commute. Yeah? So the two sectors were independent from one another. And therefore, unless I introduce the time factor, these two guys would uh, commute and not anti commute. Now, there are other quantization schemes. In particular, there's one where you work on the infinite line. Uh, and that is used quite a lot in the, in the literature, and that differs in that, in this scheme, the right and left sectors are actually not independent from one another, but because of the zero mode in this quantization scheme, they uh, have the following commutator, commutator phi right x, phi left of x prime, is I over 4. Okay? And the other commutators are the same as for me. So for y of x, for y of x prime, in this scheme uh, also would be I over 4, the sine function, x minus x prime, and so on and so forth. Now, because of this relationship, okay, you can do, you can actually just check this. Um, if I don't have the time factors, these two operators will no longer commute, it's clear, because by right and by left uh, have a non-trivial commutator. And if you work out what it is, you find uh, it's exactly the minus sign that you want. So in this scheme, I get the same bosonization formulas, but without the time factors. Okay? And so that's nice, so you don't have to uh, introduce them, and that's one of the reasons why the scheme is widely used in the, in the literature. Okay? So, I will stick by and large to these notations. Now let's forget about these other schemes. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, one formula I will want to use uh, a fair bit in what's coming is uh, a formula which expresses how you multiply vertex operators. So, if I have this number of vertex operators, so you can get alpha by y of x, gives <coughs> me i beta phi y of x prime. I want to express this as a normal ordered expression. Yeah? Because now the left hand side is not any longer normal order. This is normal order, this one, but uh, the product of course isn't. Um, but I can express it as a normal ordered exponential into the i, what I have here is alpha phi y of x plus beta phi y of x prime. Yeah. But now there's an extra factor, and the extra factor is e to the minus alpha beta. And here I have the ground set expectation now if I write of x, if I write of x prime. Okay, just to show you where this comes from, and, and uh, this formula I will uh, use over and over again in the following. 
Okay, and you will see why. But let me explain to you where this comes from. Uh, in particular, okay, so the first factor is kind of clear that you should get this. Yeah? But the second one, okay, so needs to be motivated. So uh, you can very easily understand this by just looking at a, a single mode. Let's look at a single mode. So keeping in mind that uh, this, these fields have mode expansions, yeah, so with commutation relations and so on and so forth. So let me introduce two operators. A would be alpha B plus, um, uh, let me just make sure, alpha prime B dagger. And B would be beta B plus beta prime B dagger. And these are the harmonic oscillators for a single mode. Okay? And then let me simply work out now what e to the a normal order, e to the b normal order is. Okay, what is e to the a normal order? Okay, so this is just e to the, well, it doesn't really matter, alpha prime e dagger e to the uh, alpha b. And uh, this one simply gives me e to the beta prime e dagger e to the beta b. Okay? Because when I know the order, what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to move all the creation operators to the left, all the annihilation operators to the right. Which is what I do. Okay. Um, now this has almost the form that I <coughs> want. Okay, so in order to get the form that, that I uh, like, I have to exchange these two. All right. But this I can do by this uh, baker campbell hausdorff formula. So this becomes e to the alpha prime the dagger. Um, this becomes e to the beta prime the dagger, e to the alpha b. And here I get e to the alpha beta prime e to the dagger <coughs> and, right. and then here I have e to the beta b okay and now uh, I have everything in normal ordered form so this is now a normal ordered exponential of e to the alpha prime plus beta prime b dagger plus alpha plus beta b. Okay, so which is essentially this part here. But now I have an extra piece, which is this commutator, right? So this becomes alpha beta prime. Okay. Now,
Um, okay, so the final piece is you want to work out explicitly what this uh, function here is. Yeah. So this is now a function because uh, no operators because I take the expectation value. And uh, what this function is, you can simply work out from the mode expansion. Yeah. So once again, you get one of these sums as we did it uh, uh, last time, you carry it out. And after the dust settles, this becomes equal to i a naught divided by x minus x prime times minus alpha beta over 4 pi. Okay? <clears throat> and so this formula I will use in the following repeatedly. And the analogous formula for the left moving fermion. And the only change for the left moving fermion is instead of this i, I get a minus i. Otherwise, it works the same way. All right. So now we have everything in place to go beyond three fermions and look at. What is the bosonized form of interactions in this XXZ chain? So that's what I want to do next. Um, so. All right, so now bosonic form. That is the interaction part of the, of the Hamiltonian in this uh, XAZ chain. So uh, these were a number of uh, terms involving four fermions. It was something like right dagger right times right dagger right, and it was uh, something like right dagger left, left dagger right. So all of these different um, four fermion terms. And what I want to do now is I want to use these uh, visualization formulas together with these examples of operator product expansions to work out uh, what these interaction terms look like in terms of bosons. And the upshot will be, while these interaction terms are complicated in terms of fermions, genuine interaction terms, they will be very simple in terms of the bosons. And that will allow you to solve them all. Okay? So it basically will show that this theory, which is an interacting fermionic theory, because you have a four fermion interaction, maps to a free theory in terms of the bosons. Okay, so that's the trick. So let's see how that works. Um, all right, so let, let me. Okay, so first. Uh, oh, okay, so what we saw last time was that the free part of the Hamiltonian, <coughs> I call this H0, which was integral dx i times u Fermi, left over of x dx left of x minus delta dx right. So that was the same as my compact boson. So dF over 2 integral dx dx phi squared plus dx theta squared. <clears throat> okay? And now let's go through the list of interactions one by one. Right dagger x minus epsilon right 
this plus epsilon minus the expectation value And what I do now is now I just use my positionization formulas for these fields. So the next uh, step I get limit epsilon goes to zero. I have one over two pi a naught. And here I get these vertex operators i square root of four pi by right. That's minus epsilon times e to the min uh, minus i square root of 4 pi pi y x plus epsilon minus this expectation value of the same expression. So we write it like so. Okay, what happened with the Klein factors? Just to make sure that somebody is following. <laughs> <clears throat> the product of the two is yeah. yeah, so basically it's the same time factor. So I get an eta from here, an eta from here, <coughs> and eta squared was one. So it drops out. Alright? So, so in the top line you're taking an expectation value with respect to what state compared to the bottom line. Sorry? Well so your because the top line is your Fermi C ground state. And the is the ground state of the theory of the fermion? <coughs> it doesn't matter because the mapping uh, actually is state by state. Yeah. So that is one thing uh, we motivated last time by basically uh, showing that the spectra yeah, of energy momentum and the degeneracies <coughs> map one to one. Yeah. So that means I have a one to one map between states. Okay. So here. As you correctly say, so this is uh, the expectation value with respect to the ground state, Fermi C in terms of the fermions. And here, of course, it would be with respect to the same state. Yeah? Now uh, defined um, in relation to how the bosonic uh, modes act on it. Yeah? <clears throat> okay, so now we use the OPE. And so what do we get? 2 pi a naught. Um, okay, so I get normal order e to the i square root of 4 pi pi right x minus epsilon minus pi right x plus epsilon. Yes. And then I get this extra factor, which is simply a naught divided by 2 i epsilon, once I work it out. All right, and then the expectation value is simply a naught divided by 2 pi epsilon. This one here. Okay? Now, what I can do here, what I can do here is, I'm interested in the limit epsilon goes to zero, so I Taylor expand. So this essentially becomes e to the pi square root of 4 epsilon, uh, 4 pi times epsilon, um, 2 epsilon the minus sign Ex by right. Okay. Just take our expand. And then I say, okay, so this, of course, uh, epsilon, when epsilon is very small, I can also expand the exponential. So this becomes 1 minus i square root of. 4 pi to epsilon dx phi right plus dot dot dot. Okay. And now you see that this singular piece here, which I get from the one, as it must, precisely cancels uh, against uh, the extra piece um, I had subtracted. Here, and what I'm left with is therefore essentially this term divide, uh, times uh, this factor. And what you see now, this epsilon actually drops out. I have one over epsilon here and epsilon here. 
Yeah? So to take the limit epsilon goes to zero is not straightforward. <clears throat> and what you end up with is that right dagger x rival x as defined in this uh, top line over there becomes equal to minus 1 over square root of pi normal order dx phi right of x. Okay? And all the other calculations now will uh, work in exactly the same way. So for example, if I have left deck of x, left of x, I can just copy this and uh, what I get is, this is minus 1 over root pi, here I have dx by left of x. Okay? And, um, So sometimes it's useful to, to define uh, the, the sum of the two, this column, which is actually has the uh, meaning of a current, so which would be just right over right plus left over left, and so this is just uh, minus one over pi dx phi. And then finally, as far as these bilinears are concerned, I still can look at right angle left and left angle right. Okay, so now right dagger of x left of x um, is simply times eta of r, so now here the time factors do not cancel, divided by 2 pi a naught, and here I have e to the i square root of 4 pi final x. So this is actually much easier to calculate, right, because the two sectors actually, in my scheme, they don't see each other, and to work this out, it's like a regular multiplication. You know, so there are no short distance uh, uh, singularities I have to take care of. And left leg or right is then eta bar eta 2 pi a naught e to the minus i square root of 4 pi. All right? <clears throat> Okay, any questions so far? Okay, what I will do next is I will use uh, these four or five equations to work out um, uh, to work out uh, these quartic terms. Yeah? So for example, uh, so among The interaction was a piece uh, which was essentially j of x times j of x plus a naught. Yeah, where j was defined as right angle right plus left angle left. Yeah. So this I can now work out very easily from here. So this simply becomes uh, 1 over pi dx phi squared. And now you basically start seeing the magic of this uh, visualization approach uh, to appear. Because think about it, so here that was an uh, interaction forward scattering interactions, so right leg right, right leg right, that's right leg right, sorry, left leg left, left leg left, and so on and so forth. So, complicated for fermion uh, interaction, but in terms of the bosons, it's something which is quadratic. 
Yeah? So basically just adding this interaction to my free uh, Fermi Hamiltonian still will map to a uh, free bosonic theory. Okay? Okay, so now that was the first one. Um, the second one is this one here, so I do a right dagger left, left dagger right. And uh, so I have to multiply these two. And now you see once again the Klein factors actually disappear because it's eta eta by eta by eta. So they're exactly in the right order to give me one. Yeah. And uh, what this is is one over two pi and not squared. No further equal pi squared of four pi. Phi of x minus phi of x plus a naught. And this extra factor I get in the operator product expansion here is just one. Okay. Now uh, this I uh, can simplify further. So I notice the lattice spacing, and so uh, in this continuum limit, as I defined it uh, last time, so if you are interested in the limit, A not goes to zero. Now in practice, as I already said last time, I want to keep it as some kind of uh, short distance uh, cutoff. But so A0 for me is tiny. It's a really, really small length scale. So what I'll do simply is I'll take or expand this one as well. Okay. And if I do this, uh, I get a constant which I draw, and then I get minus i divided by 2A0 pi to the three halves dx phi and then I get y minus one over two pi um, dx phi squared. Alright? And the other terms would be proportional to a naught and so it would be negligible. And so the left dagger right, right dagger left can be treated in the same way. And that gives me something like i to a naught i to the three halves dx phi minus one over two pi dx one squared. So all of these, you see, um, essentially only produce the terms which you like. So at most quadratic. So this one we can handle, this one we can handle, so we're, we're still good. Now the last piece um, is a little bit more complicated. So the last piece was the left dagger x, y of x, left dagger x plus a naught, y x plus a naught, and what that actually gives you, gives you 1 over 2 pi a naught squared, e to the pi square root of 16 pi, phi, yeah. And the right dagger left, right dagger left, gives you this minus sign here. E to the minus i is 16 pi. And that's it. Okay. 
So what I want to do next is essentially add up all these contributions and see what we get. And so what I get, let me write it here. So H interaction becomes J delta A naught integral to X. And here now I have a number of terms. So I have 2 over pi sine squared kfa naught equals phi squared plus sine 2 kfa naught divided by pi to the 3 halves a naught equals phi Finally, minus 1 over 2 pi squared a naught squared cosine square root of 16 pi pi minus 4 kf x plus a naught 2. So that's the full result. Okay, all I've done there is all of these different pieces I have worked out here, so all of these different quartic uh, terms. They also came with uh, factors uh, e to the 2i k f a naught and so on and so forth, and I just stuck them back. Right? And so this is the answer. Okay? Now what you what you do with it? But what you do with it is well the first Let's look at the last term. That's the most difficult one. All right. So now, in the regime we're working in, small delta, we can drop this for reasons I will only explain uh, tomorrow, I suppose. So uh, this operator, actually, is what is called irrelevant in the renormalization group sense. So that basically means um, the effects of this operator at low energies and large distances become smaller and smaller and smaller the lower I go in energy, the larger I go in distance. So this we will see tomorrow. So uh, merely based on this uh, fact, I, I would uh, drop this term, just throw it away. But because I haven't shown you uh, that this is correct yet, um, I can throw it uh, for a second reason. And the second reason is, I have, unless I'm in zero magnetic field, I have this oscillating factor, 4kfx. Okay? And as we just discussed before, um, if I have such oscillating factors under the integral, I can drop the terms because my fields, my quantum fields, vary very, very slowly in x. And when I do the integral, they just will average out. Okay? So therefore, uh, for now, I will assume that kf is not equal to pi over 2. And then you should all agree it's perfectly okay to drop this. Okay? And the argument for dropping it when kf is equal to pi over 2, yeah, I will give you tomorrow. Okay, I just saw some strange facial expression when I said kf is equal to pi over 2. So when kf a naught is pi over 2, then 4 kf a naught would be 2 pi. Okay, so therefore if you have something like 4 kf a naught x divided by a naught, yeah. So this becomes then 2 pi x divided by a naught. So what's, what's there in my cosine is essentially um, a cosine square root of, of 16 pi phi plus 2 pi x over a naught. Yeah? Just rewriting this thing. Because the other piece just gives you an overall minus sign, so this one I drop now. Okay, but so x is being measured in units of the lattice spacing, so this is actually an integer. 
this is j. Okay? And so therefore, when kf is pi over 2, this term is not rapidly oscillating because it's commensurate with the, with the underlying lattice. Okay? So that's the special case, and we'll deal with it tomorrow. Okay, now let's drop this term. So what about the two remaining terms? <clears throat> okay, so two remaining terms we can deal with just by field two definitions. So let me look at the effects of these field definitions in turn. Yeah. So let me look at, um, doesn't really matter, let me look at this one first. Okay. So the way to remove this is um, basically shift the field in the following way. So this is a transformation, so this defines new fields yeah, which have the same commutation relations because I just have shifted phi by a constant. However, you see that dx phi now goes to dx phi plus a constant or minus a constant, yeah, and therefore dx phi squared becomes dx phi squared minus two constant times dx phi, okay, and that was the general idea. So I want to uh, absorb this term yeah, into h naught, okay, h naught was just v over 2 integral dx dx phi squared plus dx Okay, and if I make this field definition here, <coughs> then this term plus this term just gives me now a dx phi tilde squared. Yeah, the redefined for the field. Uh, field. So if I call this if I call this phi prime or something like this, then I would have removed this term. So is that clear? Okay. Now, so this is okay. Now, however, we have to be a little bit careful. We should um, investigate what this shift actually does. All right, so at the level of the Hamiltonian, no problem. But what about at the level of our operators? Now we have to go back and remember that Cj was square root of A0 e to the i xy plus e to the minus i k f x left and then this was square root of a naught e to the i k f x by whatever 1 over root 2 pi a naught so there was an eta here e to the minus i square root of 4 pi on the right plus dot 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 okay. and you see this transformation what it does, it shifts phi right, phi right and phi left by this factor divided by 2. Because I've shifted the field but not the dual field. Yeah? So I shift both right and left by the same amount. So the, the shift cancels in the dual field, which is phi right minus phi left, but it remains in the field itself. Okay. So now, uh, what, what I'm doing up by doing this field by definition, I, let me just write another term as well. Yeah. So I get an extra piece here 
which is an e to the i bloody blow times x. And here I get e to the minus i times the same factor times x. So what I'm doing through this field of redefinition, I'm changing kf. That's what, I, that's what this transformation amounts to physically. Okay, so this amounts to, so this field redefinition. Amounts to a shift of Kf. Mm -hmm. So Kf goes to Kf plus two delta H J I N. All right. So in other words, one of the effects of this interaction is to shift the position of the Fermi momentum a little bit. All right? Okay, so now we have dealt with this term. So that leaves this term here. Excuse me. So for this reason, we don't have to consider the effect of the shift in the first term. Sorry? We don't have to consider the effect of the, the, the shift, the, the Peter definition in the third term. I mean, uh, you mean in this term? Yeah, we yeah. generate another. Yeah, term. it's a good question, thank you. Uh, so this term is already proportional to delta. Ah, so we discussed So it. that would uh, give an effect of order delta squared. So in principle, you're absolutely right, but I'm dropping it because uh, it goes beyond the accuracy of this calculation. Yeah? So, so basically, I'm trying, and so you should look carefully at the notes. Uh, to see whether I'm succeeding, so I'm trying to basically uh, keep all the terms to order delta everywhere. So, now the last term. What to do about the last term? Well, the last term, um, so the Bx by uh, square term can be removed by a canonical transformation and the canonical transformation is simply I rescale my Bose field so I define new fields 1 plus for delta sine kf a naught divided by the pi to a quarter times phi and theta tilde is the same factor to a minus one quarter theta. Okay, so that's a canonical transformation and importantly I have to transform the field and the dual field uh, in the opposite way. And the reason is, uh, the dual field is related to the canonical momentum. Yeah, so dx theta was actually proportional to the canonical momentum. Yeah, so what you should think of, you should uh, think of uh, theta as uh, basically an integral over the momentum and then, uh, as you know, in a canonical transformation, uh, transformation, the board and the momentum get, uh, well, uh, rescaled differently. So this is not a typo, this is really minus four. Okay. So now, this uh, full Hamiltonian, in terms of the new field and full field, the full Hamiltonian basically to order delta then becomes H would be some D tilde over 2 
integral dx dx phi tilde squared plus dx theta tilde squared. Okay. Where this uh, rescale velocity would be the f times one <coughs> plus two delta over pi sine kf a naught. Okay. And finally, we have to now remember that phi was a compact field. Okay. So phi had a certain periodicity. So phi was the same as phi plus two pi r. Now phi tilde, therefore, will also be a periodic field, will also be a compact field, but with a different compactification rate. So now what we have phi tilde is equal to phi tilde plus 2 pi r tilde, and r tilde is 1 over square root of 4 pi which was the result of the free theory, but now it's an extra factor. 1 plus 4 delta over pi sine delta over pi to the quarter. Okay, so now if you think about it, so what the interactions do, they change the Fermi momentum a little bit, you know, so they change um, the uh, velocity, the Fermi velocity a little bit, um, which are kind of also so drastic changes, but what they also do, they change the compactification radius of the, of the boson. Okay? And if you remember this formula I wrote uh, for the spectrum of the compact boson, yeah, it was dependent very strongly on this, on this radius. Okay, so now if we change the radius, the spectrum will be shifted by the interaction, which is very reasonable. Okay, now the, the final thing we have to do before we have the break, I have to write the bosonization formulas in terms of these new fields. Done, yeah. So the interactions basically 
have mixed, have, have, have led to a mixing between right and left. Okay? Now if you think about it, this is perfectly reasonable. Yeah? So something like this must happen. Because in terms of the fermions, so initially, so we started with a free theory, we had low energy modes here and here. But what the interactions do, so this right leg or left, left leg or right, and so on and so forth, it uh, makes particles here interact with particles there. Yeah. And this basically is the origin for this left-right mixing. All right. But um, this is basically uh, uh, now the basis. So these formulas here, they will be the basis for working out um, correlation functions in the Heisenberg chain, and this will do after the break. So we'll <coughs> Unless you don't want to have a break, in which case I just carry on. <laughs> Do they want to make you then? I want to make a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah.